Pseudoscience, to give a very simplistic definition, is something, an area of activity or a discipline which has the trappings of science, but you dig a little bit deeper and it's not real science, it's, it's, it's false science. Um, now obviously that begs the question of, well, what is real science? And uh, this has been an enormously difficult philosophical problem for many, many decades. And I, I'd say it's, it, it, it's not proved possible to come up with um, a, a criterion or a set of criteria whereby you can say, OK, tick the boxes, this is science, oh, this over here, this isn't science. Um, I mean, there have, been, there have been some very influential attempts to do that. I mean, I think, from, from, to my mind, one of the most notable was uh, Karl Popper's notion of falsification. Um, and I, I, I'm still very, very influenced by that idea. I think it's a very powerful idea. A hypothesis, an idea, a theory cannot be scientific if it is not potentially falsifiable. Um, I don't think that it actually can... You know, 100% answer the question, the demarcation problem, how you decide this is science, this isn't, um, because there are certain aspects of it that are problematic. I mean, for one thing, it doesn't describe the way that scientists actually operate. You know, no, none of us do experiments hoping that the results will come out as non-significant so that we can say, whoa, I falsified that hypothesis. It doesn't work that way. We want significant results that appear to support our hypothesis. And again, it's a very inherent kind of cognitive bias that we have towards verification. We're really not very good in terms in, in thinking in falsification terms. Um, so it doesn't describe the way that scientists actually operate on a day-to-day -day basis, but you could say, well, maybe it's it's a kind of it's prescriptive rather than descriptive. It's describing kind of science in the ideal, or science as a collective enterprise. And I think there's, there, there's some kind of mileage in that. But secondly, um, any single apparent falsification can always be reasonably explained in a way in other terms. I mean, every, you know, if, if every time a, uh, a, a high school physics class failed to get the right value for the gravitational constant, we said, oh, phew, well, looks, looks like Newton was wrong then. You know, uh, you know we, we, we wouldn't do that because we'd say, well, okay, yes, they've just not done the experiment properly. Now, taking that to the kind of level of real science going on in real research laboratories, um, you never, whenever you're testing a hypothesis, it's not just the one main hypothesis that you might have outlined in your paper. There are lots of supporting hypotheses that are implicit. The way that you're measuring what you're trying to measure, the conditions under which you're doing the experiment, etc. And it may be that the underlying theory, the underlying hypothesis is, is, is essentially true, but the way you've tried to test it is not appropriate. How People have put forward sets of criteria to distinguish science from pseudoscience and one of the interesting things is that although if you look at these different sets of criteria there are certain commonalities there's also a lot of variation and so it's clear that there is no kind of one set of criteria that everybody would sign up to one of the things that does run through all of them is this notion of falsification the biggest indicator that you are probably dealing with a pseudoscience is are the ideas falsifiable and if they're not then forget it. Whatever else it is, it ain't science. Um, but when you go beyond that, that there is kind of quite a lot of, of variation. Um, and I mean, kind of interestingly, we take parapsychology as an example. When I first became a sceptic, I was convinced that parapsychology was a pseudoscience. But the more parapsychologists I got to know, and the more I got to know about the field, um, the more it kind of gradually dawned on me that actually... I don't think parapsychology is a pseudoscience, because what science is, science is a method. It's not an established body of facts, it's a method. And if you are using that method to investigate a paranormal claim, then you are doing science. And so when uh, James Randi or Richard Wiseman or me test a medium's claims, I would hope we're doing it scientifically. And if we are, we're doing parapsychology scientifically. So, you know, you can't just look at, yes, there's a lot of pseudo-scientists who associate themselves with the area, but it's not fair to judge the entire discipline on the basis of those poorest practitioners. If you did that for psychology, you would be in a serious state. Um, you know, you look at the best in the area, and I'd say the best in the area is at least as scientific as, as psychology is. Um, and in fact, parapsychologists often have a somewhat better grasp of 
the need for double blind procedures, etc., than maybe you'd find in other areas of science. So, uh, you know, I don't know how to what extent that is a minority view, but I've changed my view on that one. I used to used to think parapsychology was a pseudoscience, and now, in fact, I'm doing a talk at the end of the month in uh, in London where I will be arguing that parapsychology deserves to be treated as a science. There, there is definitely a kind of cycle that, where history tends to repeat itself in these areas. I mean, I think the one thing that strikes you about the history of parapsychology is, to my mind at least, it's a, it's a history of false dawns. Uh, we're always being told that the next, this is it now, we have got a reliable, robust effect. And then somehow it just seems to all peter out and, you know, people lose interest in that. And, oh no, now we're doing this. This is the next big thing, you know. And, and I, think, I think that's likely to just kind of probably carry on ad infinitum, really. Um, again, going back to Richard Wiseman, Richard has more or less thrown down the gauntlet to, to say, look, you know, there, there are people out there like Dean Radin and, and, and Rupert Sheldon and various others who who pretty much have the opinion, uh, are of the attitude that it's already been established that these things are real, now we just have to investigate how they work. Well, sorry Dean, but the rest of us are not convinced. And all you need, as I said before, is one totally, not even totally, it doesn't have to be 100% replicable, we don't expect that in other areas of science, but we do expect a certain level of replicability. And that, that's, that's not been found. Now, for those who claim no, oh yes it has, well the challenge would be, set up one massive experiment, you know, pr pretty large scale thing, under optimum conditions to demonstrate this paranormal effect. Uh, you, could, you could do it in such a way that you could put the design of the experiment, the protocol, out there for everybody to look at, including skeptics, and skeptics could say, ah, hang on, you've not control for this, or, oh no, you must do it this way. You try and come up with an experiment that's ex extremely tightly controlled, that everybody agrees in advance, is a good design that optimizes the all the factors that the parapsychologist would say are more likely that you'll they'll get a positive result and then stand by the result if it comes out as positive wow that is an amazing scientific breakthrough if it comes out as negative be prepared to say you know what maybe there really isn't anything going on here but that won't happen i mean what will happen instead is we'll get a, a series of one-off demonstrations written up published I mean, I've had PhD students, I've had two PhD students who were total, I was total believers and didn't produce any consistent, replicable, positive findings to support the paranormal. You know, I've, I've had project students who do that. And OK, I'm at the point now where I don't believe anymore, but even those parapsychologists who believe that the experimenter's own psychic vibes can have an effect, well, if that's true, I'm having an effect kind of want removed because the, the students are believers and, and they're determined that they're going to produce results that will prove their know-it-all supervisor wrong, you know. But they don't. It doesn't, it doesn't come out that way. Um, so, I suspect that we'll carry on just from kind of one more false dawn to another. Dean Radin, in one of his uh, recent books, claimed that by the year 2015, you know, we would have technology that was based on the operation of paranormal forces. Well, we're nearly there, and I don't see any signs of it on the horizon, but let's see. But you can guarantee that if 2015 comes and goes and it's not happened, it won't convince Dean that the paranormal isn't real. Well, yeah, I mean, it's always, it was ever thus. Um, in, in the soft sciences, you know, psychology, parapsychology, other areas, there's always been, um, I mean, it's been described as physics envy, you know. So whatever's happening in physics, we kind of look in that direction. And, uh, and I mean, particularly parapsychology is ever so guilty of this, that there's always this kind of hand-waving sophistry about, oh, it's all, it's all based on quantum physics. Quantum physics shows this is what you'd expect, you know, it proves that telepathy must be real. No, it doesn't at all. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not going to try and worry about how to explain a phenomenon until I'm convinced that there actually is a phenomenon there to be explained. I'm not going to worry about how you might explain precognition or telepathy or clairvoyance 
until I'm convinced that some people really can do this stuff. Okay, if we found somebody who can really do it, then we need to explain it. Until then, no, I'm not going to waste my time on that. And I'm not a physicist. So if I go read, I mean, certainly Deepak Chopra is no physicist either. None of these people who are making all these, talking all this bullshit are actual physicists. And there's, okay, you get one or two physicists, including, you know, uh, at least one Nobel laureate that, we, that we're familiar with who, who do go down these kind of lines, but the vast majority of physicists don't. They don't accept these ideas at all, and they don't design their experiments. Um, you know, when the Large Hadron Collider was built, they didn't think, oh, we'd better take side effects into account. You know, they're, they're just not part of their, their mindset. They don't take them into account, and they're not interested. Um, so let's, you know, let's establish there's a real phenomenon there first, then we'll try and explain it, rather than coming up with some kind of half-baked notion on the basis of quantum entanglement that, you know, the, the, the people who are reading this stuff and who then repeat it and spout it, they don't understand. You know, I think it was Feynman who said, wasn't it, if you think you understand quantum physics, well, you don't. <laughs> you know, that's it. So I'm not even going to pretend that I understand it.